Hello and welcome to Complex ABG Cases. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I'm hoping to make this incredibly easy for you too. Let's review our six easy steps to ABG analysis as we did previously. And if you haven't seen the video on the six easy steps to ABG analysis, I certainly would recommend that you go back and review that one first before we get into these complex cases. What we did is we went through the steps in the process of looking at the pH and looking at the CO2, then looking at the bicarb. Then we analyzed each one to determine whether or not they were normal, acidotic, or alkalotic. Comparing either the CO2 or the bicarb with the pH, and then we asked if the other one, so the CO2 or, or bicarb, goes the opposite direction of the pH, and lastly looking at the O2 and the O2 saturation. So here are our normal values. And again, if you need to review the six easy steps, feel free to go back and to review them again. We're going to use these as we move forward in talking about our blood gases. So here's our six easy steps. Is the pH normal? Is the CO2 normal? Is the bicarb normal? And with each one of these steps, we're going to say it's normal, it's acidotic or alkalotic. Stay away from up and down. A lot of times I hear people talk like that. We talk about the pH is increased. The pH is high, the pH is low, CO2 is high, CO2 is low. When we're talking like that, in terms of the blood gas, what's going to end up happening is we're going to get confused because not all of the stuff goes the same way. In fact, a high CO2 creates a different problem than a high bicarb. So that's why we want to start talking in terms of acidotic and alkalotic because then it'll make sense and then we can match in step four the CO2 or the bicarb with a pH. After we've done that, we move to step five. We look and see if the CO2 or the bicarb goes the opposite direction of the pH, and that would be compensation. Lastly, are the PO2 and the O2 saturation normal? So we're then finally, after we've made our determination about pH balance, then we start to look at our oxygenation. One of the mechanisms that we spoke about earlier was compensation. Compensation refers to the body's ability to try to make sure that we have a pH of 7.4 in the blood at all times. If we're going to have all of the tissues in the body work the way they should, we need to have a pH of 7.4 consistently in the bloodstream. In order to do that, we have two different systems that are balancing our pH. One is the lung with the CO2, the other is the metabolic system with the bicarb. So these are the things that can move quickly. We have other buffers in the body, such as hemoglobin, etc., but those don't move quickly. So we need something that can move relatively quickly in order to be able to compensate and to maintain a normal pH. So let's say that our patient has a metabolic acidosis because they have chronic renal failure. So the kidneys can no longer maintain a normal pH. So now it is up to the respiratory system to kick in and to try to balance that pH. So in that case, the body will start to blow off CO2 in order to create more alkalosis in the lung, compensating for the metabolic acidosis. Okay, so the alkalosis is going to compensate for the acidosis, creating more of a normal pH. Another measure that we speak of is called the base excess. The base excess is a way of being able to measure the amount of buffering that we have in the body. So it gives us a, it gives us a way to be able to quantify the extent of our pH imbalance from the metabolic system. Okay, now the base excess, we don't, it's measuring the metabolic system, it's not measuring respiratory. Respiratory is pretty easy to measure. You got a high CO2 or a low CO2. I mean, that's the only mechanism in the lung that's being measured. However, in the metabolic system, we have lots of different buffers. Now we talked about bicarb, bicarb being one, but we also have hemoglobin and albumin. Those are two of the major buffers in the body 
to help to maintain our pH balance. However, when we get a acidosis, a metabolic acidosis, then what's happened is that those buffers, the hemoglobin and albumin, are no longer able to be able to compensate for that acidosis. So we look at the base excess as a measure of the extent of that pH imbalance. A normal base excess should be zero. We should not have too much base, right? Okay, base is alkalotic, right? So, and when we talk about excess, it means how we have too much of these buffers. Kind of an interesting way to describe this whole process here. Where it comes into some confusion is when we start talking about a negative base excess. Wait, did you follow that? A negative base excess. So if we have a negative base excess, that means we actually don't have enough base or buffer. So that's where it gets a little confusing when you start looking at our numbers. So the normal range is between 2 and minus 2, so right around 0. Minimal type of a acid base imbalance would be a 3 to 5 base excess and severe would be greater than 7 in our base excess. Again when we look at base excess we're looking at it in terms of how much we have in the way of buffers. So if we have a plus 10 that means we have too many buffers. right? If we have a minus 10 that means we have not enough buffers and would in indicate that we have a really severe metabolic acidosis. Another measure that we look at is called the anion gap. The anion gap is the difference between the positive electrolytes and the negative electrolytes in the body. So the difference between the positive electrolytes and the negative electrolytes. Okay, when you look at the formula down on the bottom there, you can see that it's listing out what some of those are. So the major positive electrolytes in the body is sodium and potassium. The major negative electrolytes in the body is chloride and bicarb. The reason why we would look at an anion gap is to help us to determine the cause of a metabolic disorder. Well, it's very clear what the cause of a respiratory disorder is. It's the lung. And there's no mystery there. But a metabolic disorder could be from diarrhea, could be from renal failure, could be from acidosis that's being caused by the patient having inadequate perfusion. So in order to try to find the cause of the metabolic disorder, we will look at the anion gap and it helps us to be able to localize where in the metabolic system the disorder is coming from. Now, Again, kind of like our base excess, we have a normal range, which is normally 10 to 15. In this case, though, rather than calling it a normal range and saying, okay, well, if, well, if we're between 10 and 15, we're okay, we're good, right? No, no, no. That What this means is just, and, and I've termed it a little differently here, a normal ratio, a high ratio, and a low ratio. And the reason why is because there's no normal Okay, so we already have an acidosis. What we're trying to do is to find the cause of it, and so that's why we're looking at these ratios. Now, a high ratio anion gap would mean that we have a, a big gap between our positive and our negative electrolytes, and that would be caused by ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, your patient who's in shock, for example, uh, uremic acidosis, poisonings, and a normal ratio. Okay, so the anions are lost in the positive and negative electrolytes rather are lost in the same ratio. So we maintain a normal ratio, but we still have acidosis. That would be caused by diarrhea, renal tubular acidosis, or volume resuscitation could also cause that. A low ratio, in this case here, now we've lost more negative electrolytes than we have positive. A low ratio would be caused by severe dilutional states and hypoalbuminemia. So to recap, base excess tells us about the quantification of our acid or our metabolic disturbance, and the anion gap helps us to find the cause of a metabolic acidosis.
Okay, well, let's take a look at the cases that are in your handout. So download the handout from the link in the video description and follow along in your handout. Hopefully, you can work together with a colleague so that you can compare notes as you go along. Well, here's our normal values again, just to recap. Our pH is 7.35 to 7.45. You notice that tight range right around 7.4. Normal CO2 is 35 to 45. Might be easy to remember because it's the same last two numbers as the pH. Our PO2 is 80 to 100. Now, this is not a percentage, so it can go higher than 100. This is an actual measurement. Uh, O2 saturation 95 to 100 percent, our bicarb 22 to 26, and then our base excess is plus or minus 2. So let's take a look at the first example. In case 1, your patient is a 66-year-old male. He was admitted for a left lower lobe pneumonia and an exacerbation of COPD. He has a history of COPD, hypertension, and non insulin dependent diabetes. His vital signs are his blood pressure is 155 over 90, heart rate of 118, temperature or his respiratory rate is 33 and his temperature is 38.5. Now let's take a look at his blood gas over on the left hand side. So the blood gas is on the left, on the right hand side here is your normal values to help you with comparison. pH is 7.21. So his pH is we're going to label it again as normal acidotic or alkalotic. So in this case here, the pH is less than 7.35 and therefore is acidotic. His CO2 is 60. 60 is greater than 45 and therefore is acidotic. His bicarb then is 23. 23 is in the normal range. So we match up either the bicarb or the CO2 with the pH, and we have the CO2 matching the pH. So this is a respiratory acidosis. In step five, we ask, does the bicarb go the opposite direction? And in fact, it does not. So we have no compensation. This is important when we're looking at a patient with a respiratory problem, because what this indicates is that this patient is having an acute event. So this is not where he lives. You know, we hear people say that, oh, well, you know, he's got a CO2 of 60. That's probably where he lives. Okay, no, not in this case, because he does not have compensation. If this is where he lived every day and his CO2 was chronically 60, then his kidneys would kick in and they'd start making more bicarb, and we would see some compensation with a higher bicarb level. Maybe his bicarb would be like 30. So we would see some compensation there. Lastly, we take a look at his oxygen, his oxygen saturation, PO2 75, O2 saturation to 92%. So if either one of those values is low, we say the patient has hypoxemia. And in this case, they're both low. So it fits with his diagnosis. He's here with pneumonia and exacerbation of COPD. So it makes sense. Lastly, we take a look at his base excess of minus 4. Okay, remember a normal base excess is plus or minus 2. In this case, it's minus 4. So we have a mild type of a uh, acidosis that's occurring. The patient is started on BiPAP with the initial settings of an inspiratory pressure of 10, expiratory pressure of 5, his rate is 15, FiO2 of 35, repeat ABG shows. His pH is 7.35. 7.35 is in the normal range. So we label that as being normal. Now, however, because we know that there was an acid-base imbalance, whenever we're looking at blood gases and we think there might still be an acid-base imbalance, we might want to label this as to what side of 7.4 it lies on. So even though it's in a normal range, it's on the acidotic side. So we could label it as normal slash acidotic, and that way if there's another value that's acidotic, we'd be able to match it up. That's going to make more sense a little bit later when we get into some compensation. His PCO2 is 43. 43 is in the normal range, so we got that down with a little bit of BiPAP. 
His bicarb is still 23, so we have uh, no compensation. Lastly, we look at the PO2 and the O2 saturation. PO2 is 85, O2 saturation is 95%. So we're back up into the normal range, and we got rid of that hypoxemia. Lastly, we look at our base excess, minus 2. We're back into the normal range for our base excess. So now we have a normal blood gas. However, this patient is a COPD patient. The patient is currently on BiPAP in order to achieve this normal blood gas. So we would expect that the patient would continue to use BiPAP as we're giving antibiotics and as we're treating the patient, and hopefully we would start to see his blood gas resolve even more, blow off more CO2, get more oxygen in, and be able to wean off the BiPAP and back to room air. Case number two, your patient is an 88-year-old who is admitted for a urinary tract infection, dehydration, and urosepsis. She became profoundly hypotensive and was started on dopamine and levofed and given IV fluids for blood pressure support. Okay, she's admitted with a UTI. She has a diagnosis of urosepsis, and now she's hypotensive. What does it sound like? She's in septic shock. Her blood pressure stabilized, tube feedings, were restarted and care was resumed. However, she continues to require high levels of pressure support to maintain her blood pressure. A blood gas is drawn in the following vent settings. Her pH is 6.88. Woo! And that's really acidotic, less than 7.35. Her CO2 is 46, greater than 45, which is also acidotic. And her bicarb is 8. Woo! That's really low. And acidotic. So we match up which one matches the pH. Well, they both do. So this is a combined respiratory and metabolic acidosis. How bad is the acidosis? Well, take a look at that base excess, minus 22. Remember that 7 was a significant problem. We have a minus 22. That's a huge acidosis. So you see the benefit of using the base excess here? Is obviously, you can look at the pH and say, well, 6.88, that's really bad. But having that base excess gives us a way to quantify it and say, minus 22, that's huge. Then an anion gap of 18, so that's a high anion gap. Remember, a normal anion gap is 10 to 15. High anion gap is associated with having a lactic acidosis, which it kind of looks like that's the case here with the patient who has a septic shock. So after adjusting for the administration of IV fluids and vasopressors with temperature and activity control, your patient begins to stabilize. I'm guessing, too, they also gave some antibiotics here. The blood pressure now is 90 over 60 with minimal pressure support or pressor support, that's very good. Uh, ventilator settings remain the same on a repeat blood gas. The pH is 7.28. All right, we're getting much better here. Still acidotic. CO2 of 46 is still a little uh, acidotic. And then we go down and we look at that bicarb of 20.9. It's just a little bit under that 22, so we're still acidotic. So we still have a combined respiratory and metabolic acidosis. However, take a look at the base excess, minus 5. Okay, much better. It's still a problem. It's not in the normal range, so we still have an acidosis. But our acidosis has improved considerably. Now, you could take a look at our pH and say, well, yeah, I can tell that by the pH. I mean, come on, you know, it's 7.28 versus 6.88. I mean, you can tell that's quite a bit of a difference. The other thing the base excess helps us to be able to determine in cases like this is how much of that acid-base disturbance is caused by the metabolic system. So if the pH, I'm sorry, if the PCO2 was 70 instead of 46, you might say, well, this is primarily respiratory. And we quantify that by looking at the base excess. Well, in this case here, there's a minor contribution by the metabolic system. And the pH really isn't that low when you have that combined uh, respiratory and metabolic component going on here, but 
uh, that's one way to be able to use the base excess to help us to find how much of the acid base imbalance is being caused by the metabolic system. Lastly, again, the anion gap, normal is 10 to 15. It's the high level of the anion gap there, probably still because we're in a lactic acidosis situation, but it's starting to resolve. Case number three, your patient suddenly goes into ventricular tachycardia, which rapidly deteriorates into V-fib. He is a 65-year-old with significant atherosclerotic coronary disease and sudden cardiac death syndrome. A blood gas is drawn during his prolonged resuscitation. And we see a pH is 6.92. 6.92 is less than 7.35, therefore is acidotic. CO2 of 75 is greater than 45 and therefore is acidotic. Then his bicarb of 15 is less than 22, also acidotic. Now, this makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? This is a patient who is being resuscitated. So we had a period of time he's not breathing, period of time he's not circulating. So we would anticipate finding both a metabolic and a respiratory acidosis. And that's, in fact, what we have. PCO2, 75, we have bicarb of 15, metabolic, and respiratory acidosis. Now, here is one of those situations where you look at the CO2 and say, wow, CO2 is 75. Maybe this acidosis is primarily caused by the respiratory system. All right, let's take a look at the base excess, minus 16. Huge component coming from the metabolic system. So yeah, we still want to blow down that CO2, but we have a huge component coming here from the metabolic system that we need to resolve as well. Anion gap of 16 is greater than 15, indicating that this is a high ratio anion gap, again, probably caused by lactic acidosis. So our patient's severe metabolic acidosis is contributing to his low oxygen carrying capacity. If you recall the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, one of the things that affects how well oxygen binds hemoglobin is our pH. And because the pH was so low, we were having a hard time binding oxygen to hemoglobin, and therefore an amp of bicarb was administered. The results for the, the follow-up ABG are uh, pH is 7.30. Okay, we're still acidotic. CO2 of 50, okay, so a little better, but we're still acidotic. And then our bicarb of 24, now we're back into the normal range with our bicarb. And our base excess minus 2, that's back in the normal range. Anion gap is still a little bit high, indicating we still have some lactic acidosis going on. So right now, the primary problem is a respiratory acidosis. We've taken the metabolic component out by giving the patient bicarb. His PO2 now is 210. His oxygen saturation is 99%. Remember, again, with the PO2, we can go higher than 100, per, or 100 millimeters of mercury if we are giving supplemental oxygen. So in this case here, the patient's being resuscitated. We're giving supplemental oxygen. Look at that PO2, 210. And it took that much to get a 99% saturation. The point being is that the acidosis is interfering with how well the PO2 binds to hemoglobin to become oxygen saturation. And it has to bind to hemoglobin to get to the tissues. We don't use PO2. We use the saturated hemoglobin oxygen at the tissue level. So it's important that we're getting that oxygen bound to hemoglobin so that it gets out to the tissues. Case number four, your patient is a 44-year-old who has a history of abdominal pain. He complains of severe pain in his upper left quadrant, radiating to the back. The pain worsens with the ingestion of food. Although he has vomited three times since admission, his pain is not lessened. Previous history includes peptic ulcer disease and asthma. Social history includes heavy alcohol usage. As part of a fluid and electrolyte assessment, a blood gas is drawn. His pH is 7.55, greater than 45, so that would be an alkalosis. His CO2 is 32, okay, less than 35, that would indicate an alkalosis. His bicarb of 27 is also 
alkalotic. So this is a combined, this is both a respiratory and a metabolic alkalosis. PO2, O2 saturation are normal. So there's no problem there. Now we jump down and we take a look at his base excess plus five. Remember we're seeing all those minuses? The minuses happen with acidosis. Plus five happens with alkalosis. So we have a minor metabolic alkalosis and we also have a respiratory component to this. So it's telling us that the metabolic component is minor and most of this alkalosis is coming from our respiratory system. Our anion gap is 8, which would be significant if we had an acidosis. In this case, not as significant because it's an alkalotic state. So let's take a look at what happens. An antiemetic is administered, and the patient is instructed to breathe into a paper bag for his hyperventilation, and a repeat blood gas is gone. Now, now you see what happened here is that the patient was blowing off CO2. That's why we ended up with that low CO2 level, because he was hyperventilating. The other part is the antiemetic. As the patient is vomiting, he's losing acid, and so therefore he's going to start to develop a metabolic alkalosis. So now the pH is 7.46, still a little alkalotic, not quite back into the normal range. CO2 is 38, that's normal. Bicarb of 26, so that hasn't moved yet. So we have a minor metabolic alkalosis. PO2 and EO2 saturation remain good. We look at our base excess now, it's down to plus 2. So we're getting back to a normal state here with these the interventions that have been done in this patient. Case number five. This is a 77-year-old female. She was admitted on Friday night for cardiogenic pulmonary edema. She's intubated, ventilated for hypoxemia and hypercarbia. Vent settings are listed there. She diaresed well over the weekend and remained stable. Blood gas is drawn on Monday morning before weaning her from the ventilator. Her pH is 7.46, greater than 7.45, therefore is alkalotic. Her CO2 is 38, that's normal. Bicarb 26 is alkalotic, or just on the alkalotic side here. So it's normal, but we'd have to lay... We'd have to label it normal slash alkalotic because it's kind of on the alkalotic side. So we just have a very minor alkalosis going on here with a pH of 7.46 and probably is not really significant. Something maybe you'd want to watch. The base excess is plus 2, so that's in the normal range. Everything's in the normal range except that pH is just barely poking outside of that normal range in the 7.46. And the only thing that comes close to matching it is going to be the bicarb, which is on the upper level of alkalosis. Orders for the following vent settings, and, and now we do a repeat blood gas. Now you take a look, the pH is 7.14, less than 7.35, and therefore is acidotic. CO2 now is 38, again, so that's normal. Jump down to bicarb now, drop down to 13. So we have a severe metabolic acidosis going on with a base excess of minus 15. Okay, so pretty, we quantify it as being pretty severe. So what happened here? We changed the vent settings from assist control down to SIMV, and suddenly now the patient has got a metabolic acidosis. Now you'd anticipate that there's some other things going on that we don't know about. You'd see some changes in the vital signs, too. This patient was admitted for cardiogenic pulmonary edema. In cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you intubate the patient, you ventilate the patient, and now suddenly there's positive pressure in the thorax, and that positive pressure holds the fluid away from the heart. That's a great way to treat pulmonary edema, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. The patient probably has underlying heart failure. So now we've held all the fluid away from the heart. We switch the vent mode 
to SIMV. So now the patient is doing some of the work. They're drawing in that breath, or they're initiating that breath at least. There's less positive pressure in the chest. And now all that fluid is coming back up, overwhelming the heart, and we're going into cardiogenic shock. So even though the PO2 and O2 saturation still seem to be okay, the CO2 seems to be okay, from a ventilator standpoint, you might think, well, okay, well, it has nothing to do with the vent because all the respiratory components are okay. But you can see the effect that the respiratory components have on the metabolic system in a patient who has heart failure, changing the intrathoracic pressure from positive to negative. Well, thank you for using complex ABG cases. I hope you enjoyed this. Please visit us online. Come see us at thenursingprof.com. Thanks again for joining me today. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now.